This is Sarah Curry at Barrow House on West Virginia State University campus in Institute West Virginia, interviewing for Your Voice in History Project Life. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Curry. You're I'm Lou Myers. And um, I'm just going to ask um, basic questions about um, um, your formative years, um, where you grew up, your parents, how they raised you, what traditions and values they instilled in you, um, where you went to school, who you played with, and um, any friends or siblings, and um, your education. Well, I was born at the, uh, Cabin Creek, Lyon, West Virginia. It doesn't exist anymore. And uh, I grew up there, went to elementary school, Wake Forest, a little school called Wake Forest. Uh, and that's where I went to elementary school. From there, I went to uh, high school at London. It was called London. There was Garnet was in Charleston, and London was up in uh, Washington High School, was the name of the school at London. And that's where we went to the high school. And from high school, I went into the military. But Cabin Creek, we were coal miners. And uh, so I grew up with coal miners, my grandfather, my father, and uncles and friends, they all went in to those mountains, three feet wide, three feet high, about eight miles back into the mountain. This was their life. I watched it through the third eye. I'm glad that somewhere or another I was able to see it as a third eye. Because I talked to many of my friends today and you know, we would say they don't, they don't remember too much. But I had to get back and watch it. And I saw those men go into those mines. And <clears throat> they'd come out and work five days a week. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, they would play softball, baseball, go to the club, get a beer, make a little love, and then Monday they were going back in those holes. And all of this just began to come back to me. They were strong young men who had hopes and dreams of leaving West Virginia, coming out of those mountains and doing stuff. I refer to the young people today who do rap and want concerts and, and contracts. I remember looking back then and there was quartets that went from church to church and they would sing now what we call rap today they were rapping uh, they would get a lead singer and behind that lead singer there'd be three or four men going oom like a like a like a oom like a like a <laughs> so that was their style and I thought I said you know they were trying to oom like a like a like themselves out of those dark holes. Because they were looking for a future. We forget sometimes. Uh, I was incubated by those men because they saved me from having to go in those mountains. So I missed it. And I'm so glad I did. I remember my uncle some day going into the war. I was about five, six years old. They, went to the Charleston, the bus station, and they went to the Philippines and places like that. <coughs> when they came back with their uniforms on and smiles, they had been to the Philippines, they had been here, they had been there. I remember that, how strong and beautiful they were. But they had to go right back into those holes. There were no jobs for them. Because the same jobs that you uh, went in to get that coal out, they took that coal all across America, 
fired up furnaces to create materials and everything, but they were not allowed to work in the in the uh, in the factories. So they couldn't follow the very coal and stuff that they had brought out. There were plenty of jobs for black men on the railroad and in the mines. If you came in town and needed a job, boy, you got a job tomorrow. But you could not follow that to the factories. They didn't hire the black men in the factories. So when they did start hiring them to clean up, they were happy because it was a big up from going into their minds, them holes in their minds. So I saw that happen. I saw that change. And I was determined that I wasn't going to go into the mountains. But <clears throat> they incubated. They came to Charleston places and there were restaurants, music, pool rooms and so forth. And they worked together and had a good time. Uh, partying and dances came in, so they, they made a great life for themselves. So I grew up with that, being around a lot of men that I saw go to work in the coal mines. And I knew I was fortunate to be home and I saw the ladies be home and cook. And uh, I think you had mentioned there what was our favorite, our favorite food was pinto beans. And you worked in the mines, you deserved a pork chop. <laughs> you deserved a pork chop because you had to work hard, which helped me to do that. But pinto beans and pork chop and light rolls, that was our main thing. And if you had green beans on Sunday with a piece of uh, uh, potato in it, and you were something, and don't have some jello and cake, oh, you were really middle class on the weekend to have jello and cake. So I really, really had a good time. I didn't know that we were poor. And I remember some of my was telling me we were poor. I got mad and got in a fight because they said we were poor. I thought we were. My daddy had a car and we would come to Charleston, walk the streets of Charleston, get a hot dog and so forth and go back up to, we was anxious to get back up into the hall after we come to Charleston and walk around Capitol Street, Summer Street, spend the day. By that evening we was ready to get back up there and pitch horseshoes back up in the mountains. So I didn't know that I was supposed to be poor. So I was really blessed by being able to use that third eye, which I use now, to see stuff. You better go ahead because I'll keep talking. No, just go ahead. <laughs> well, direct me to something that you want to um, What about any friends or... Um um, what'd you do with the neighborhood kids? Or? Well, we we had a couple of little places we call holes. And that was on side of the road, a place big enough to, for four or five cars to pull off. And we would play ball there, serious ball. Fight, ball, and everything, and then we'd go home. Uh, we would get together and save our little money and, have a party, and then that evening we would all wash up, clean up, and go to somebody's house and have a party. There were several people in the community who helped us. Uh, there's a lady called Miss Henrietta Daniels. She was a church lady, and the first play I ever seen was a play that she put on about uh, Jesus and Samuel and, and um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all that and for Christmas, and I was just amazed. And I, 
the older kids did the play. I was too young to be in the play. But it was amazing for us to see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We've been hearing about. And there they were. She put on plays like that, which inspired me. And they did it two nights. Now that was Broadway. Oh, two nights. The second night we had to go back and see the same play. And uh, it was wonderful. The girls who did it were all like 14, 15. I must have been about eight or nine. But that was really my introduction to the theater. So when I went and did Different World TV, I came back and I told her about her having taught me my first drama lesson. <laughs> she laid me out real good. I didn't teach you that evil. I didn't teach you that. <laughs> I was kind of devastated, but I knew. I went on back to Hollywood. I came back again because I had to visit her because I loved her. And she said, you know, I did teach you that, didn't I? She started seeing me on TV. She said, I did teach you that, didn't I? That was, that was uh, taking her back. And people like that. There's another lady that used to put on dances. And she'd always say, can't no children come? Can't no children come? Just adults come. And we'd be all be sitting back because we knew once the dance started that she was going to let us in. And they'd be in one room with the adults. Case of beer. It was 24 bottles of the beer. Oh, they had a lot of beer. And they'd have us in the other room. So in those days, the children wasn't allowed to socialize with adults when they party. So we had to stay in the other room, drink soda while they drank beer. But that was a strict thing. The older people would not party with you. Where shall we go from there? Um, how about any um what other values or traditions were instilled in you by either your relatives or um, neighborhood? Um, well, we went to church, and uh, Baptist church, little church. There were little churches all over, up and down the hall. They were all the same, same message, same sermon. But I enjoyed it. I think the actor was in me then. And I enjoyed it because I would get inspired on weekends and then I had to go to school on Mondays. And I would take that inspiration to school. And I, I don't never had nobody to talk that to because my classmates and all they, you know, oh, church. But <clears throat> I saw it that way. But I also saw it through that third eye. I guess that was the actor in me. And so I saw the inspiration. I saw the quartet men singing, ooh, like a, like a, like a, ooh, like a, like a, like a, what the rappers called today, rapping, that was their rap. Oh, Jesus, ooh, like a, like a, like a, oh, Moses, ooh, like a, like a, like a, ooh, like <coughs> They were trying to ooh, like a, like a, like themselves into contracts to get out what these people are talking about rapping, they want to go. So the spirit hasn't changed. Their hopes and dreams has not changed. Same hopes and dreams that they were trying to get a better life, come out of those mountains. The boys today, they don't want to do certain jobs, and so they go into the rap. But I look and I see and I'm old enough to have seen their uncles, their daddies, some of their grandparents. When I see them today, I ask, who are you? When they tell me who their grandparents are and parents are, I know who they are then. But just looking at them, I don't know. But uh, they're really no different from those people. Uh, so I went into the military. 
Uh, I had a high school education. My daddy had died. I had a lovely stepfather who took me in and fed me. And 11th grade, there was no future for me really. Uh, I went into the military, Air Force. And I was determined that I was going to get my GED, my high school. So that's where I got my, finished my high school, was in the military. Got that GED, I was so happy. And then uh, I was stationed over in Japan, and that was wonderful because I was in a new place, and it was different, it was exciting. And they had college courses on the base. And I started taking my first language, which was German, studying under a Japanese professor studying German. <laughs> studying German. So that when I came back to college, I would have credit, because I knew I had to get that language and I knew that was going to be rough, so they didn't teach the French and I wanted the French, but I went on to start taking the German. So my language was, my undergraduate language was German. And uh, got that GED, took more college courses, and I think I had about nine, ten credits. And I came to West Virginia State. And when they accepted me, oh, it was a thrill. That I was over Japan and I wrote them, I had finished my GED and had these college credits. And when I was accepted at West Virginia State College, that was a thrill. And all of the young men that I was with, about 20 of us, we had spent two, three years together. The whole conversation was, what you gonna do when you get out? I'm gonna be a lawyer, I'm gonna be a doctor, I'm gonna be so-and-so. At the end of those four years, I, don't, I think I was the only one that finished the GED. They were running around behind those Japanese girls, having a good time. And that time went by just like that. And now they were ready to get discharged hadn't got their GED, and I saw through the third eye, because I knew my uncle, so they had to do the same thing. They went to the Philippines, and came back home with saluting, smiling, and had to go back into those holes. I was determined I wasn't gonna do that, so when I was tempted to go out and party, some told me, say, remember that hole? Remember those holes back then? That's what you're going back to. So no, so that motivated me to get my GED, get extra courses. Came to West Virginia State, and I had a wonderful, rough, exciting time at West Virginia State. Uh, parted, but I had sense enough to study. And uh, four crazy years, and I was getting the GI Bill, which was a blessing, because my bills was paid, so I could, you know, party, and I was able to, ex-serviceman, I was able to get a car. So I really had it good. I guess I could tell some horrible stories, but I really had it real good. And I had a car the whole time I was in. Went and got a job at the hospital, which helped me with some income. So I was almost a rich student, getting a GI Bill and, and working at the hospital as a orderly. So I was kind of blessed. And then I left here and went to, went to New York. 
to study theater. Went to Cleveland. Someone said, well, go to Cleveland first and get your feet wet, because New York is so big. And after you get your feet wet in Cleveland, then you go to New York. And I sat back, I thought, I said, now if I go to Cleveland, to get me an apartment and everything for a couple of years, if I'm going to study theater, I got to leave there and go to, to New York? I said, no, I'm going to make a shortcut. Boom! <laughs> I ain't going around Robin Hood Bar. <clears throat> End up catching the train, and a friend of mine was in New York. And I ended up catching the train, getting off in New York. Said he didn't know nothing, or nobody was looking around. But I had gotten my college. And uh, I was looking for jobs. And you know how hard it is now. And it was hard then. And a young black boy coming out of school in New York with all those big fancy jobs and things. I realized through that third eye how difficult it was. So there was two opportunities, a social work job and a job in recreation. I took the exam in recreation, which was wonderful. And they put me in a recreation center. They didn't hardly know what recreation was, but they put me there. Didn't give me no equipment, no nothing. There you are. Kids come off from school looking at me, playing <clears throat> handball. But I could not sit in the corner and do nothing. And the Spirit told me, he says, well, what do you know how to do? I said, well, I can't do nothing. Just open your hand. Didn't you have drama courses at West Virginia State College? When you in the theater department? I said, yes. <clears throat> he said, well, go get that book and start teaching those kids. And so I started teaching them the plays that I had done at West Virginia State College. And I started a little drama group. And uh, I didn't run an audition so much, but that was my strength. By teaching them, I went over the stuff, Julius Caesar, Shakespeare, we did the Greeks, Medea, and so forth like that. So that's what I had learned here at State, and that's what I started teaching. And it strengthened me, and I taught for years. And I could have went off in the corner and sat down with a bologna sandwich and waited for them to come and leave, but my thing was to do something. So I did, and I built up a nice little theater group. And uh, I would teach during the day and go to auditions and plays, and that ended up leading me into professional theater. Those little leaps that I look back now and I see they were a blessing. You know, and I see people laughed and, oh, they gave me a pretty rough time. I was going to preach a little bit, which I didn't know that was the actor in me. But I preached a little bit. Oh, Reverend Kelly, he had a little church on the hill. <clears throat> and as a freshman, sophomore, sophomore, and I was studying philosophy. And he had me to speak at his church. So I would preach a little bit at his church. And <laughs> got the conflict goes in and during the week I would be raising hell. And <laughs> that was a conflict, you know. So the conflict kinda got the conflict kinda got a little overwhelming, you know fighting and cussing all week and then <laughs> going, to, going to get ready to go preach and becoming holy and sanctified at Sunday to go to this church. But that was a blessing. He gave me an opportunity to speak. So West Virginia State College helped me develop in all kinds of ways. I, you know, I, I, every, 
every department here that I touched upon. Departments that I wasn't even into. My curiosity made me want to know, well, what are they teaching? So the lady who taught head of the art department, she befriended me. We were talking about Miss Nelson. And she was a rough lady, but I didn't take English from her, but she would look at you, and I got enough English from her, just her looking at you saying, <laughs> so I knew whatever I was supposed to be doing, I was supposed to be doing it. You thought I'd have classes under her. So those kinds of teachers, uh, and me listening, because I got friends that I go back and try to say the things I'm saying to, and they, oh, I don't remember, oh, that old lady. Da, da, da. And I'm amazed that they missed the essence of these people. I was able to get the essence of them. Those men in the coal mines, I saw them work five days a week, come out, play softball, baseball, get a beer, make a little love, go back in the mountain. I knew what that was. And today, I communicate with them because I speak about them and I know that there is only one connection. <clears throat> so I'm allowed to connect with them. So in my work, uh, which I've been allowed to do a lot of television, I've been allowed to do a lot of movies. You'd be surprised, I'm surprised at the names of big stars that I have worked with that are big stars. Angela, Angela Jolie, was, uh, people like that, Holly Berry, that I have worked with, but I did small parts with them, but we united. Remember Angela Jolie, I was in Germany doing a play, film. No one knew her, but they knew me from different world. So we go in the streets in Berlin and everybody, people, this is the game. Who is this? Mr. Gaines. And she and Brandon Fraser played the mummy. They were the stars of the movie, but no one recognized them. But they all knew me from being the cook in uh, the sitcom, Different World. I just named those two, but I look back, I work with everybody from Alina Horn to, you heard of Alina Horn? You never heard of Alina Horn. She was the first black woman that was a star. And they created makeup for her called White Light Egyptian. They didn't know what to do with Lena. And she was in my, my mother's generation. Beautiful woman. So she really represented the black race. Joe Lewis, the boxer, you've heard of him. Uh, Ralph Bunch, he was at the United Nations. We as black people didn't have but three people. Lena, Joe, that was a model, I forget her name. But <clears throat> Lena had it rough because <clears throat> the blacks gave her a rough time. Oh, you out there with all them whites trying, acting and trying to be grand. And then the whites, the whites gave her a rough time because she was just beautiful and gorgeous and they didn't want her because she was really a star. And we became friends toward the end when she came into a different world. And through that third eye I could see that lady spent her whole life alone because she couldn't be on this side, she couldn't be on this side, and they was fussing that up from here. So, but she maintained. And when I talk about her, uh, now that I'm older and I've done films and so forth, and I perform, and I see how people come at me, and I see how alone she was and how necessary it was for her to be who she was of that they would have destroyed her. 
So it's the same thing with Lou Myers today. Uh, I had to see myself as Lou and then Lou Myers to protect Lou Myers. And so I worked there in New York for years in the, in the communities. And I ran down children and chased them. I remember some of the parents came over to this place, mad at me. What are you doing to our children? Then they found out that I was really just chasing their tails up and down the road. I was really working with them because I didn't know any better. This is what I was incubated to do. Boy, where you going? So this is up. And I remember some of the parents looking at me like he's talking to me. And this one little boy, they dead now. They're all dead. And this lady says, oh, Lou and what's your name is fighting. And she came over there because I was fighting with her son. And she got over there and said, I said, well, where is it? She said, oh, he's gone with Mr. Myers in the car somewhere. She said, oh, shoot. I forget the kid's name. But they were like children. They are dead. The streets took them. And the girls, a couple of them I know now, I know her daughters. But I was just thinking how grateful I was because if I had had another attitude, what happened to that man in Philadelphia at the school? Can you imagine what they would rip me apart? That I went through that community for all those years teaching and you know, cussing, <laughs> fighting them and whipping them and everything. Can you imagine if they had had anything on me? And I go there now and perform in an outdoor center, outdoor arena, and they, grandchildren and children and people of that who knew me then, can you imagine how they would treat me? They'd have ripped me apart. They wouldn't allow me to come there and perform. They'd set up a committee. Here he come, get him. But I was blessed that I can go back and put on a show. And all they can say is, that's Mr. Myers. And that, that doesn't mean that I didn't have my thing I was doing. But I had learned from people like watching Lena. I didn't know her then, but watching that third eye, and it saved me to be Lou Myers and then to be Lou. And I was able to keep it separate. My military experience gave me discipline. So I just put it all together and here I sit. That's it. Is there anything that I guess could talk about? Um, Who took responsibility for household chores up there? And <clears throat> I would cut wood because you had the coal stoves. And you started it with wood, then you put the coal on it. Mm -hmm. So my job was to make sure we got the kindling wood. At night, you get the buckets of coal to set back so you could use, but you had to have that kindling wood to cut so that next morning you could start your fire. So that was always a job for young boys to cut the kindling wood, clean up the yard, do those kinds of things. The religion, well, all we knew was God, Jesus, and you know you're going to die, and it scared me to death with, oh, the Lord will come in the middle of the night, and he may take the woman and leave the man. You better get your soul right, because he'll take one and leave the other. Scared me to death. <laughs> so they had another song. Uh, it was a song that, but he was singing in church. He was showing up, scared me. My grandmother was get it right with God and do it now. 
Get it right with God, and He will show you how. Some of those songs would scare me. Because they, they would sing it. Uh, you got to walk that lonesome valley. You got to walk it for yourself. There's nobody here can walk. Oh, that valley would scare me to death. <laughs> You don't hear that kind of stuff no more. Maybe our kids need to hear that. So uh, that was my religion. Of course, I got interested in, in philosophy. And here I studied, uh, you know, Rousseau and the Greeks and so forth. And I would go back up and the people up there would look at me like, oh, you done got you bringing this in, so it was a conflict by me studying philosophy here, and then on the weekends I'm at home, and they gave me a rough time. Remember, I came in and saw people that I love said, "Oh, you in show business, but this is God's business." I went to see them to say hello, and they were sitting there with the Bible, looking at me like. I'm, they ain't never said, well, hi, Lou, how you doing? Oh, you, you in show business, but this is God's business. It hit me so deep, but the Lord always gave me an answer. And I had to speak up to save myself because they were crushing me. And I said, everything I do is God's business. If God ain't in it, I don't do it. I think I changed their lives. They were like my mother's and granddad's generation. But that's what you do in this show business. They put me down. But this is God's business. I was so hurt. I said, everything I do is God's business. If God ain't in it, I don't do it. I don't think they spoke to me anymore. holidays and Christmas. Oh, we would be getting ready for Christmas. Cleaning house, paint, Santa Claus coming. We cleaning out the yard. Christmas started early in December. We getting ready for Christmas, which was a big deal. Then everybody dress up. On Christmas day, you put on your new clothes. And there was mud in the streets, because there wasn't no streets, but you rolled your pants leg up <laughs> and, you, and you went on out there in the mud. And you had your suit on, but you rolled your pants legs up. And, and so Christmas was, and then we'd have a Christmas party. A couple of the ladies had a Christmas party. Catherine Daniels would have a party. And we'd all dress up and go to her house. We thought we were, it was great. And some of those people wasn't too nice to me later on. But they didn't know that I saw them. They didn't know how much I appreciated them. Because I was an older little man, little said it, that little man, she said it. There he come. But they didn't know how much I was watching them. And today, I would not, you hear me mention some of them that they don't know how they influenced me and today I can feel their love because I understand that that thing we call death, they, they is here and they communicate and they're here to help me. Would you give me one of those napkins? So uh, that's how I connect my religion to stuff I've studied. You know, I was going to be a Catholic for a while because I was so confused and I was going to be a Muslim and I was going to be a this and a that. And I've studied a lot of religion. When I was in Japan, I went to the Shinto temples and everything. And what I found out is that the very little thing that I was doing up there in Cabin Creek wasn't no difference. 
And I was able to see that. I was about crazy, <laughs> you know, about crazy, but I was able to see and I was able to come through it. <clears throat> and I think by now I'll kind of put it together. I think by now I'll put it together where all of that, I get a little impatient with people about religion because it all boils down to technology. And the greatest technology is love thy neighbor as thyself. And it's really not religion. It's technology. You want to build business or anything else you want to build. Loving thy neighbor as thyself is not a religious thing. You can't do nothing unless you work together. That's how the stars, the moon, the sky, and everything, where it works together. You can call it whatever you want to call it, love or whatever. But sometimes I, what we call religion, just gets in the way. It blocks people from the greatest technology. One thing I learned in physics was an object in motion remains in motion until acted upon by some outside force. I hear that on TV, but they leave the second part off. You've heard it a lot. An object in motion stays in motion. An object is if it stays, but they never say until acted upon by some outside force. That's part they leave off. And I hear it now all the time. And so I just, I didn't study physics, but on my own I did. And I could see the connection to the universe. And now I understand the knowledge that came out of Egypt and before Egypt, Pythagoras brought it to the Greeks. When you go to school today, they start with the Greeks like the whole world started with the Greeks. That's a lie. <laughs> they bored the writers, didn't they? He gave them music, math. They killed him. They didn't, and now they skin alive. Because he dared to tell them about the connection of all men. Pythagoras carried it to the Greeks. Uh, Socrates, and those people went into Egypt to study. They were in Egypt to study. Plato was known that he studied in Egypt. 